Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. We're super excited to be here with you all tonight. My name is Sydney Richter, and I am a student um, coordinator with the McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement here on campus. And I'm super honored to be here with you all tonight. On behalf of the McCarthy Center, I would like to welcome you all to this incredible event, Decolonization in Action, Service and Research with Native Nations at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University which is on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ashinaabe nations. Tonight, we're joined by some absolutely incredible guests, and I would like to ask them all to introduce themselves at this time. Hello, my name is Jamie Arsenal. I am the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Archives Manager, and Repatriation Representative for the White Earth Band of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Daniel Bachmeyer. I am a senior sociology major, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Balen Benway. I'm from the Prairie Island Indian community, and I've been working as a Native American undergraduate for the past couple of years, um, research assistant, and I'm a senior communications major. Hello, my name is Maya Eikhoff. I'm a senior environmental studies major at CSB. I use the pronoun she, her, hers. Hi, my, my name is Ted Gordon. I am a, a, an anthropologist and a professor in the sociology department here at St. Ben's and St. John's, and my pronouns are he and him. Hi, everyone. My name is Faith Granda. I'm a CSB junior majoring in biology and peace studies and I'm a member of the Wyandotte of Anderton Nation in Michigan. Sister Mary Therese Woida, archivist for the Sisters of the Order of St. Benedict in St. Joseph, Minnesota. Hi, my name is Claire Winters, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a senior sociology and environmental studies double major, and I work under the Mellon Grant with Ted Gordon as an archival research assistant in the um, uh, monastery archives. All right, uh, Boju and Hao, welcome everyone. Uh, here at St. Ben's and St. John's, many are surprised to learn that these were once native majority campuses. In 1890, 60% of students at the monastery schools were native and 50% at the abbey schools. These native students were not part of regular academic programs. They were students of the industrial schools. Starting in the late 1800s, the government attempted to annihilate Native communities by separating children from their families and sending them to boarding schools, where their culture was forbidden. While some parents sent their children willingly, the government threatened to confiscate the homes of families who refused to give up their children. There once were hundreds of schools like these, uh, not just the ones that operated on our campuses, although these were here from the, in the 1880s and 1890s. And the Order of St. Benedict also operated two reservation-based schools, one at White Earth and one at Red Lake. Our institutions were once agents of colonization, complicit in the government's goal of forcing assimilation through family separation. We have more to gain in redressing our past than in hiding from it. Where we once were agents of assimilation, we can become champions for decolonization, forming meaningful alliances that strengthen Native nations on their own terms. Tonight, I am honored to speak alongside Jamie Arsenal, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the White Earth Nation, and students leading efforts to repair our community's relationships with Native nations. If you take anything away from tonight, what we want you to know is that the story of our community's history with Native nations is complicated, and it does not have to end with these boarding schools. We can write a new chapter, and I invite all of you to join us. Midwich, Pitamaya, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. To start us off tonight, um, we have our very special guest, Jamie Arsenal. Hello. Um, so as I had said, I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer uh, here at White Earth. Um, and my main uh, goal is, is I am the um, official officially recognized uh, tribal representative um, in terms of um, 
cultural preservation and historic preservation for uh, multiple sites. I, I want to thank uh, Teresa Martin from MnDOT who actually introduced Ted Gordon and myself and kind of got this conversation going. Uh, so it's all about these different relationships that we have in these different agencies that we are in contact with. And um, as, as TIPO, I had been in contact with Teresa on, on different projects. And she had then put me in contact with Dr. Gordon and, um, and, and all these other relationships started to develop. Um, at White Earth, uh, what I do is I, I work to protect um, different uh, cultural and natural resources that are important to the community, both historically and now, the, the, the areas like wild rice, uh, watersheds that people continuously use. Um, I also manage the archives department. And so um, I'm constantly looking for, you know, old photographs and stories and documentation about uh, the White Earth community so that community members will eventually have access to these materials and be able to use them at their own discretion. Um, the other thing that I, I do is I'm the repatriation representative uh, for the tribe. Um, and that's a real complicated piece as well because um, for a long time, um, native you know, languages and, and spirituality and ceremonies, all these things were uh, illegal um, in this country. And it wasn't until the American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in the 70s that, um, that those types of, of practices really became forbidden um, on the books, right? And so during these times when um, there was um, harsher crackdown on these uh, ceremonial practices, um, during a time when assimilation was really the goal for the federal government, um, items and children were removed. So there was mass amounts of dispossession, dispossession of children, of, of sacred items, of language, and um, the items were scattered throughout the country and throughout the world. So part of my job is also to look for where they ended up, where, where did those stories go? Um, and so the more Dr. Gordon and I um, spent time together, we realized there are so many opportunities uh, with all of you um, to, to look at stories that are right there and see what that next chapter that we write together will be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Next, we have student Faith Granda here to talk about her research. Um, hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. I have a few um, photos to share. Um, just a sec. <laughs> okay, can you guys see? Okay, awesome. So, um, yeah, basically, I'm really excited um, to talk to you about the work I've been doing as a part of Dream of Wild Health to promote decolonization. So Dream of Wild Health is a nonprofit intertribal organization that has a 10 acre organic farm in Hugo, Minnesota. And the mission of Dream of Wild Health is to restore the health and well-being of the native community by recovering knowledge of and access to healthy indigenous foods, medicines, and life ways. And so this is carried out in a variety of different ways. But first, I want to talk to you about food systems. So in short, colonization completely destroyed native food systems and it has been extremely difficult for native tribes and communities to be self-sustainable because of everything that was stolen from them. There is now a revitalization and a push to bring back food sovereignty to native communities and Dream of Wild Health plays a very important role in this effort. So as I mentioned before, um, Dream of Wild Health has a 10 acre farm where we grow vegetables and indigenous foods to provide the native community um, in the cities with easy access to these. Furthermore, it is important to emphasize that along with food, knowledge needs to be provided at the same time. And um, because of that, we offer a variety of classes within the native community where community members can learn about ancestral traditions and food to promote this food sovereignty. So the slogan we use at Dream of Wild Health is we grow seeds and we grow leaders. So while I'm talking about food sovereignty, um, a vital thing to talk about is indigenous seeds. And so indigenous seeds are basically seeds that have been passed down from generation upon generations, 
um, through many different tribes. And I cannot emphasize um, how sacred native seeds are in native culture. They are the closest um, living things that we have to our ancestors and they are held with the highest uh, respect and regard. So because of colonization, many tribes were separated from their seeds and from their traditional life ways, which has um, caused an immense amount of heartbreak and pain. But now there is this push to reconnect tribes with these seeds, um, and they're becoming more and more organizations um, with this mission. And Dream of Wild Health is one of them. So I've been a part of Dream of Wild Health for six years. Um, I started as a youth in high school, and then I've gotten the opportunity to work on staff for the past two summers. Um, during one of these summers, I had the opportunity to be the Indigenous seed intern, and I was able to learn so much about these seeds and develop a relationship with them and a lot of knowledge about them. But basically, my work was to grow and revitalize these seeds because we need to preserve them. And because we believe that the youth are the future, it is so important that we have these ancestral seeds to pass along to these future generations. And so I was able to gain a lot of knowledge in that area and I'm really blessed to have had this experience. Um, but this is just another way that Dream of Wild Health promotes decolonizations. Um, additionally, as I mentioned before, I began my journey with Dream of Wild Health as a youth in high school. And this is because Dream of Wild Health believes that the youth are the future and um, has consistent youth programming throughout the summer for a variety of ages of different native youth. And so these youth um, from the Twin Cities are driven up to the farm and um, the farm basically becomes a second home for many of these youth and they're able to reconnect with ancestral traditions and knowledge and learn how to grow these foods and cook them. And there is um, an immense amount of knowledge that is offered. So the main point is to provide an environment where these youth can become strong in their native identity and learn how to advocate for themselves. Um, and I have been very blessed as a staff member to use this knowledge that I've acquired over my six years um, to teach um, various classes to these youth and also teach classes in the community. Um, so in all, I'm very blessed to be a part of this incredible organization. And these are just a few of the really important things that they are doing to promote decolonization in our area. But before I close, I would like to make a call to action and say that the time is now. Um, decolonization is an active process and everyone needs to take part in it. Um, this process needs support and it needs your support. And I encourage you to see how you can support the native communities around you and uplift native voices because they have been silenced for so long and there's so much pain and trauma that goes along with that. Especially given our institutional history, we have an obligation to do better and to promote change on campus. There are many initiatives that are present here that just need your support. So I encourage you to reach out and learn how to be an ally and advocate and a support system for the native community. In closing, um, thank you all for being here. We have amazing, an amazing list of presenters and I'm very excited for you to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Next we have um, Claire Winters to present. Hello, um, once again, my name is Claire Winters. I am an archival research assistant with the Mellon Grant and I work in the monastic archives to um, find information about the school that was run on the White Earth Reservation. Um, so I'm gonna pull something up quick. Okay. So let's see, there we go. So this is a timeline and what this is, is it um, more or less is a summary of some of the major events that we have found throughout the research. So just to go over the basics. So in about 1878, um, as you can see, you have the dates. Um, so the three founders of the school who were sisters Ayabra Braun, Philomene Kenton and Father Aloysius Hermanitz, um, all were German or first generation German families, arrive at the White Earth Reservation in, 1945, um, the boarding school closed and it became a day school till around, if you can see where my mouse is, about here, so around the 1970s. Um, and so you can see here, there's um, a very sudden growth around the 1890s and how much the school can hold. It was, it's important to note, um, originally it was intended to be a co-ed school that had a day school part of it. It very quickly became a girls only boarding school. Um, so what's important to note about this is that well, we have a lot of information and we know a lot about some of the things that went on there. The good news about um, Benedictines, as anyone who's been in the archives can tell you, is that very thorough. There is records and records and very helpful people. Um, 
some of which are here. So hello, and thank you so much for all your help with me because um, Lord knows I would have gotten nowhere without you. Um, but moving on from that, so one of the important things to note here is that while we know a lot, there's still so much we don't know. Um, by virtue of it being a Benedictine and monastic archive, it is designed to create the record of the Benedictines, more specifically um, in St. John's, the, um, the monks, and for St. Ben's, the nuns. So we have a lot of information. We unfortunately don't have much of anything really of the experiences of the students and the people who lived on the reservation. Um, these are often very much oral histories versus the written histories that we have, which are very administrative and very academic. Many of the sources we work with are quite literally records of funding. Um, the school relied very heavily on philanthropy through various Catholic institutions to run itself. So it's a lot of thank you notes. Um, we also have some stuff that is very much related to students, but unfortunately that is very much based on an inclusion attempt from Benedictines themselves. It wasn't very much an open process, it was selective. So this is why um, communication is so important because when you work with the communities that were affected by this and whose story it is, you are actually able to learn and address and grow and establish these relationships that are so vital. Um, let's see. One other important thing to note is that the relationship that was shown here, um, it was very much a school, but it's important to note that the school was just a method of assimilation. Um, put bluntly, the people who came to this school didn't really fully believe in any idea of acculturation or equity or anything like that. This was fundamentally not only um, an assimilation tactic, um, there's quotes from the founders of the school saying that they believe the boarding school was the best way to educate and assimilate because it allowed the largest method of control over other forms of education because the students were there year round almost. Um, so there is a very strong method of paternalism throughout all these things. It's very much, we think we know best, we believe we know best. So there's obviously a lot of pain and a lot of issues that come from that. What records we have from students, they often cite that, well, it wasn't something they would have chosen for themselves, that this was something that they were acculturated through earlier in their life. So assimilation is something very important to note here um, because the people here who came to the school very often were sent here by their families because the school was on the reservation and the government schools were not. So it was really the lesser of two evils to go here. Um, Another thing to note is that while this was assimilation, over time things did change. Part of this is because the people who ran the school, as I mentioned before, they were German immigrants. Very often they were the people who came and then it became first and second generation immigrants. So especially in the start in the first 50 to 75 years, most of these people were bilingual and they were not English as their first language, which is important to note because unlike most reservation schools, um, this school never had a formal ban on uh, the native language. And that's mostly because, as I mentioned before, the students here were already um, some level of culturally Christian, so they were more attuned to the sort of assimilation that they were trying to do, but also because half of them didn't speak good English. So they couldn't really teach or control everything, and they also would speak German to hide things from the students. And while it was certainly not encouraged to speak the native language, students still sometimes managed to get away with it, but for obvious reasons, they still can do it. So it's very important to note these kinds of dynamics as well, especially because assimilation tactics doesn't just go through the school. Many of the founders of the school tried to integrate themselves into the um, community, partly through uh, religious outreach, but also through political and other methods. Um, one of the founders of the school, Aloysius, for example, he did actually go and do political work on the federal level for government to advocate for residents of this um, reservation. But again, the important thing to note here is he did this on the belief that he was the best person to do this because they cannot do it themselves. And so I would say the main thing to take away from this is that there is a lot we can learn from outside of this history because while we know currently a lot about how it worked and how it operated and why it operated, um, if you can't really tell for everything I've explained, we know so much about the Benedictines and what they thought and how it grew and evolved, but there's still very little we know about the students and there's still very little we know about the oral histories and the relationships and their interactions with this. And part of the ways that we've been able to improve this is by going through outside sources. There are many newspapers that were run on the school 
that have, and, um, and on the reservation that have been shown online. And what we've gathered from that is that it was very complicated. Many of the people knew that education was something they had to submit to because there was no other choice for them because otherwise their children would be forcibly taken from them. And so there was that tension that they didn't want their children to be educated, but they knew that there wasn't another option and this was the best way to survive and preserve their culture by going along with it and trying to preserve what they could. And of course, there's also some very hilarious things. Um, someone at the school had a pet parrot. Apparently that was very important to some of the children, but yeah, those sources are so important. And so we're very lucky to have the testimonies we do from the students. And we hope through partnerships and work and continuing to explore and find other ways we can continue to put students at the forefront as they deserve to be at the start and should be restored to. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Claire. Next um, for presenters, we have Balin Benway. Hi, um, so as we kind of talked about, there was the two industrial schools on our campus that brought in Native American students from tribes around Minnesota. And my job was to gather more information on this through photographs from the schools. So our goal was to create awareness around our campus history and past goal of assimilation. So one of the main projects that I worked on was down in the archives and I was digitalizing photos um, any photos that I could find from the schools, scanning them, trying to identify the children in the photos and what tribes they were from, so we could categorize them into groups. And through this process, we found school photographs, large photos, um, large group class photos, pictures of the children in the class playing, um, photographs of the spaces and classrooms. And in total, in the end, I found about 150 photographs. Um, for this project, our specific goal was to be able to share the photographs with their respective tribes. And that was a pretty special thing to do, considering that um, a good amount of these pictures hadn't been seen in like over 100 years. So that was really cool to be a part of. And then another project that I worked a lot with was Vivarium, which is a place where you can search for school articles going all the way back to the 1800s. And through Vivarium, I categorized all the articles having to do with the industrial schools on our campus. And so through this, I created a searchable, searchable catalog for all of the articles pertaining to certain topics that would be helpful for people to utilize in the future. Um, I categorized and searched key terms such as industrial schools, Mille Lacs, Leech Lake, Fond du Lac, White Earth, and Red Lake. And I focused more on the Ojibwe tribes in Minnesota because it was these tribes that were greatly affected on our specific campus. And in the end, I recorded over 500 articles on these topics. And in these articles, we were able to find and learn more about specific events and even some of the events we weren't even previously aware of as a school. And so this catalog can help us analyze how our institutions publications have been representing native community communities for over 130 years. Um, those are the two main projects that I've been working on in the past couple of years, but those, that's just a summary of it. And thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Um, next we have Dan Bachmeyer for his presentation. Good evening. Again, my name is Daniel Bachmeyer and I'm a senior sociology major. This summer I was able to build upon Balin's work in Vivarium and also work alongside Ted and Jamie because of the funding provided by the Jackson Fellowship Program. For my work this summer, I created an annotated bibliography with a total of 608 entries that amounted to over 661 pages. Working together, Jamie and I created 14 tags and four sub tags to categorize common and important themes within the documents within the documents gathered. After we created these 18 tags, I read closely through each of the 608 entries and categorized their content. The end result was an annotated bibliography containing every reference to the search terms white earth or industrial school that exists in the archival documents already uploaded to our online portal, Vivarium. 
I'd like to highlight two findings from my research this summer. The first is an excerpt from an article written by Father Doug Mullen in a 2007 issue of the Abbey Banner. The excerpt goes as follows. The federal Indian policy sought to assimilate Indian children into the dominant Euro-American culture and society by educating and socializing them away from their families and traditional culture. The policy was a failure from the start and fortunately short-lived. It is now recognized that the plan would have amounted to cultural genocide. While there were undoubtedly many good intentions and even positive results for the children who attended these schools, if these schools had been successful in their primary purpose, the loss of native cultures and identities would have been a great evil. I find this passage so significant because out of the 661 pages of text I compiled, this was the only instance that the evil inherent to the operation of the industrial schools was explicitly acknowledged and actively condemned. The next finding I would like to focus on comes from a 1988 issue of the Abbey Quarterly and 2005 issue of Community. These publications mention the artifacts obtained from the White Earth and Red Lake nations that are held by St. John's Abbey. These artifacts include drums, moccasins, jingle dresses, peace pipes, bandoliers, baskets, toys, beadwork, and birch bark containers, as well as food preparation and storage items. These artifacts were used as specimens in various museum exhibits put together by the Abbey. I want to stress here that from my research, it is clear that these items were obtained by members of the monastery under conditions of duress. I also want to stress that decolonization, the subject of this talk, is not finished once we have conducted research or condemn the actions of our fathers. Rather, we must continue the process of decolonization through concerted action. Therefore, because these art artifacts were obtained under the climate of cultural genocide and due to the current desire of the tribal communities for their return, it is of the utmost importance that these artifacts are repatriated to the people of White Earth and Red Lake. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Our final student presentation is with Maya Eikhoff. Hello, uh, again, my name is Maya Eikhoff and my work with White Earth, Tippo and Jamie this summer was twofold. Um, first this summer, I was another student researcher. I focused on uncovering sources outlining the historical and cultural significance of wild rice in Minnesota. Throughout the summer, I spent hundreds of hours scouring databases, historical newspapers, and combing through academic writings. These sources validated how important wild rice is for the Ojibwe people, and also the state and land now known as Minnesota. Another part of my work this summer was to conduct interviews with ricers. It was an absolute joy to be able to talk with these people who continue to actively partake in the ricing processes I had been reading about in an academic sense. Listening to anyone who is willing to share their lived experiences is always a pleasure, but being able to make that tangible connection between the Ojibwe culture and research to it in actual practice was a highly unique experience. The purpose of both the research and interviews was to help Jamie create a traditional cultural property report or a TCP for wild rice. A TCP designation documents the historical and cultural significance of a location to an existing culture. A TCP requires an association with cultural practices, traditions, and beliefs of a living community, so it fits with how wild rice relates to the Ojibwe people. Wild rice is incredibly significant to the Ojibwe culture in multiple ways. It plays a key role in the story of how they came to this land. Eating it can have a deep spiritual connection. It's a staple healthy food, and it's an essential avenue for community building and bringing people back their cultural roots. I think it fits perfectly within the parameters of a TCP designation, which gives me a lot of hope. This leads to another purpose of our work. Once this site is registered as a traditional cultural property, it can be put on the National Register of Historic Places. This designation will protect the area designated from any development. I became involved with this work because of my passion for the climate, for climate, environmental, and social justice. 
Pipelines such as Line 3 can disproportionately impact native lands and peoples, and this TCP could act as another barrier against development. As an environmental studies major, I couldn't just sit in the classroom with this knowledge and not do anything about it. As college students, we have access to resources and time, and we can make a difference. Having access to Academic Search Premier, JSTOR, and all of these wildly expensive databases is such a privilege, and in this case, it's a tool we can utilize to complete such an important tasks. This idea offers a transition to the second way I collaborate and work with Jamie. During my sophomore year, I applied and was accepted to the Entre Entrepreneurial Scholars Program, meaning I'm a part of a three semester long course about building and launching a business venture. During the past year, I've started building a nonprofit organization called Gijan, pronounced G Ja Din. It's an Ojibwe word meaning to guard or watch over. This organization came about as another way to work within the truth and reconciliation framework between CSB, SJU, and White Earth that this panel has been discussing. Gajadin works at the invitation of White Earth's TIPO to support projects and preserve and protect significant historical locations and cultural practices. For example, branching off the wild rice research I did this summer, I recruited volunteers to help with the TCP annotated bibliography. The overall goal of Gijadin is to further aid in rebuilding relationships between White Earth and CSP and SJU to move forward towards a brighter and more equitable future. Two of the main ways that we're doing this is through recruiting volunteers and fundraising. Volunteers would help with anything from annotations to marketing and branding to the business's financial and accounting side. Also, if you're interested in a tangible way to get involved with this work, Tomorrow from 4.30 to 5.30, there's a virtual event with Campus Ministries, Spirituality and Social Justice Branch if you want to become involved with annotations. Please fill out the form that I'll put in the chat after, my, um, after I speak to become more involved. Lastly, if you feel so inclined, we have a live GoFundMe for donations. We would greatly appreciate it if you follow the link to our campaign and donate. 100% of your dollars will go directly to supporting the essential work of White Earth's TIPO. Thank you so much to all of the other presenters tonight and to the McCarthy Center for, for putting this event together. It's been a pleasure speaking tonight. I look forward to hearing from all of you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Next, I would like to welcome back um, Jamie Arsenal one more time. Thank you all. I'm, I'm just so grateful for all of the work that you have done. Um, you know, if this was something that was just left to me by myself, it would take me a very long time to try to get through, you know, the hundreds of pages that Dan went through and hundreds of photos that were located and uh, all of the wild rice interviews and, um, you know, the, the um, graphics that you created, you know, it's, it's an amazing and wonderful thing. I, I think initially when um, some of these conversations first started, there was a little bit of anxiety, I think, you know, kind of felt it for everyone, you know, um, wondering how these conversations would go, you know, would there be a lot of anger? Would there be um, any kind of resentment? You know, what, what kind of, what would we encounter working together? And, um, you know, the way that it has been for the past couple of years now, has been uh, really uh, transformational. Um, it's, it's been a very healthy experience. I feel that, um, you know, the work that you all have done, it will build the archives for the tribe. It will allow families to see photographs of loved ones that they've never been able to see. Um, it will potentially lead to repatriation. You know, some of the uh, work that, um, that Dan had, had done, um, it allows for me to document lines of evidence. So that can be applied to any institution anywhere in the country that um, falls under uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So being able to pull documentation that's held within your archives could return, you know, hundreds or, or, or thousands of, of items or bits of information here and there. Um, so 
the work that you're doing is incredibly important to this tribal nation, um, but can have ripple effects for others. Um, being able to work on um, the wild rice research, um, the, the interviews that were conducted, um, you know, some of those folks had never been interviewed about rice before. Um, and so now, now there are these stories, right? So you're going back and you're looking at all these old stories and you're bringing them to light and that reconciliation process can begin, but then you're out there and you're creating new opportunities and new stories and new collaborative relationships. So um, I'm grateful for everything that you all have done and I'm very much looking forward to our continued work together. Um, I am looking forward to the day when COVID is done and we can bring students up and we can bring community members over and we can kind of just get everybody together and, and really have these conversations in person. Um, but I thank you. I thank you very, very much. Thank you. And finally, um, before we begin our Q&A portion of the night, um, I would like to welcome back Ted Gordon. Jimmy Wicks, Jamie, thank you for your kind words. Uh, it means so much to, to have your, uh, your support and, and, and your time. Um, the research that all of you heard about tonight and the service of research, this is, this is transformative work that is showing how much we have to gain by acknowledging our, our past and working to repair it. And first, I have to acknowledge uh, Sister Mary Therese Voida, the monastery archivist. Thank you so much for all of the, the, the time you've spent uh, with our students, at the monastery uh, archive. We would not be able to do what we've been doing without you. This is very Faith, true. <laughs> uh, Faith, you know, your, your work with Dream of Wild Health shows how revitalizing indigenous agriculture strengthens both, both native health and spirituality. Uh, and uh, it's, it's so exciting to see an initiative that brings, uh, uh, that returns these practices to, to native youth for, for future leaders. Claire, your work in the Monastery Archives reveals the complexity of the Wide Earth Mission School. You've shown us how there is no singular story, but a, a diversity of experiences uh, and, and perspectives that we are just beginning to understand. Balin, when you started, we only knew of a few photographs. Your work is so powerful because you've helped reunite families with photos of their relatives, and that's priceless. And you've also given us a glimpse into life at these schools. Dan, you used your, our institution's publications to re reveal a history that was hiding in plain sight, unearthing stories that help us and White Earth understand our shared history, and you've created a priceless resource that will help us work to rebuild our relationships. Maya, your work with Jamie to protect wild rice will have a lasting impact. And Gajadan has the potential to become a vital force of student-driven energy to serve white earth. I encourage everyone to follow Gajadan as it develops. Jamie, your passion for protecting white earth's cultural resources is inspirational and the time you spent with me and our students is invaluable. We've learned so much from you and I'm so excited because I know that we're just getting started. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a, an opportunity as well that, that I wanna share with you. Um, there's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, and tomorrow, the Spirituality and Social Justice Group is going to host uh, a service event at, at 4.30 um, uh, where people will be able to, to join uh, uh, via Zoom and uh, take part in helping build an annotated bibliography that will help protect some of these white earth sites, uh, some of these wild rice sites uh, by helping uh, uh, us learn more about um, what is in the archives and what already exists and get that into the, the traditional cultural and property reports to protect them. So this is an opportunity for all of you to get involved with tomorrow. Uh, again, I encourage all of you to, to, to follow uh, Gajadin as it develops. And if anyone is ever interested in knowing uh, ways in which they can get involved or help, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. There are lots of opportunities. This is important work that, that we're called to do and that benefits everyone. 
so uh, Migwitch, Pitamaya, and thank you to everyone for joining us. And we do have time to take some questions. Thank you. And for the Q&A portion of tonight, um, how it's going to work is if you can access the chat function, um, if you have a question, yes, the program is recorded. Um, if you have a question, just type in the chat and say, I have a question and I'll call on you. If you would prefer um, that I ask the question for you, if you don't want to unmute yourself, you can just actually type your question in the chat and I'll read that out loud for you all. So if anybody has any questions, we can get started here. Okay. Teresa? You can unmute yourself and ask whenever you're ready. Oh, sorry, not Teresa, Megan, my apologies. Hi, thank you. Thank you all for um, really great presentations. I really appreciated learning more about um, the schools we're at. Um, I have a quick question about is there easy, is there a way that you all are sharing this research in a way that I could easily share with students of mine? Um, and then I have a more complicated question. I was curious about what the process of repatriation will look like. Um, and if the kind of, if there's some indication on the institutional level, how smoothly that will go and how quickly. Uh, let me, let me take kind of the, the, the first question here, which is, um, there's a number of resources that we've been putting together that can be used uh, in the classroom. Um, uh, for example, uh, the, the library last year created a fantastic digital exhibit with a timeline and history of these schools. That's, that's something that's really accessible. Um, we have um, uh, uh, some, some, uh, uh, some articles and some things uh, as well uh, that, that we, are, we are working on uh, and, and want to be able to, to, uh, to, to have uh, out there and accessible as well. Um, and, um, you know, this event is, is being recorded. Uh, um, uh, they're also, uh, you know, I also, if people are looking for other videos and things as well, uh, the, the Peace Studies Conference last year was, uh, had, a, had a whole panel as well on, on this topic. Uh, and, and that was recorded as well. So those are a couple of items. Um, now the issue of repatriation is a much more complicated one. Uh, and I, I just wanna kind of, uh, I, and I'm gonna defer to Jamie on that. Um, I just wanna kind of briefly say that, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting and, and, ex and exciting when, when Dan was able to find list of what was brought. Uh, um, uh, by the Abbey uh, from White Earth uh, to, uh, to St. John's. And, um, you know, I will, I will let Jamie take it from here because, um, you know, in terms of what, uh, what is still in possession, where things are, um, is a long and complicated question. Uh, but Jamie has a lot of expertise on, rep on, uh, on repatriation. And um, I also will say, and then I'll, I'll stop talking and pass it off to Jamie, but, um, you know, Jamie, actually, maybe I'll, I'll put this to you. Could you speak briefly about what your, you know, what your, what the White Earth collection is right now of its own artifacts? Um, you know, I, I just couldn't believe when I saw the disparity um, there. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking and let the expert take it from here. I'm no expert. Oh gosh. Um, so, so one of the things that you were mentioning about with the, um, the information about the boarding schools for the classroom, I'm very much looking forward to being able to make those available to the white earth schools as well. And the white earth tribal college. So this, this will have ripple effects in many, many classrooms. Um, Within uh, the topic of repatriation, uh, it is complicated, especially with COVID now. Um, you know, normally I could request a, a, a listing, an inventory listing, you know, from an institution and, and just what do you have? Uh, and we could kind of go back and forth and have this conversation, meet in person, um, and have real honest conversations about what the next steps might be. Um, 
COVID makes things a little bit more tricky. Uh, the other thing that, that can be tricky sometimes is, is sometimes institutions don't necessarily know what they have. They may have mislabeled things or misplaced things even. Um, so I think there'll be, and I'm not saying that that is the, inst the instance here, uh, we haven't got to that place yet. And so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to having that conversation um, when it is, you know, safe and, and for everyone, you know, being able to meet in person and, and view items. Um, but normally we would have these real honest conversations back and forth. Um, and then my office could put in a, a um, claim and then um, the institution would work with me and we would send something to uh, National NAGPRA in, in Washington, DC. Um, they would then review this claim and if, you know, everything checks out, then they would publish that in the um, federal register. And so that allows for other tribes to have in, you know, 30 days to kind of review this and, and make sure that there's no counterclaim, nothing like that. Um, and then a repatriation would take place. Um, I'll say that I've been doing that type of work for about 20 years, just over 20 years. Um, in every instance, it's been a deeply transformative, and I know I use this word right more than once, but um, it's been a very transformative and healing moment for not just the communities, but also the institution. Um, there are not um, bad things that come from that, you know. Um, I think on the museum and institution side, they are often worried about having empty shelves. And what ends up happening is you end up with richer relationships. You end up being able to talk more fully and clearly about that history. You end up being able to have these exchanges with living community members. You end up being able to access works made by people who have names that you can recognize and, and share willingly as opposed to something that may have been taken under um, conditions that uh, were not equitable and maybe the maker or the family is unnamed. Um, so, so we start to be able to e even that playing field a little bit. Um, but that relationship stays, you know, there are repatriations I've done with institutions over 10 years ago and every year we, we get together and we talk and um, we can always call each other up, you know, so um, it's a really strong working relationship. Within the White Earth archives, um, it's important to know that, that uh, a lot of items were, were taken and spread across the country and around the world. So uh, a lot of the shelves are currently empty. Um, you know, we've brought back some key uh, items that are very important to the community, um, uh, but space is also something that's very limited for us. We're, we're looking for a you know, facility to be able to build a facility that would accommodate you know, larger repatriations, um, but that's not, stopping us from putting these claims forward, you know, getting that information back, getting that documentation back, getting um, key items back. That's, that's part of, um, it's part of, of this nation's story. It's part of who they are now. Um, it's, it's part of the, the community. Um, and everybody stands to benefit when repatriations occur. Um, so, you know, it's, potentially a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that we have before us. And I, I thank Dan very much for his hard work in that regard. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sean and Charlie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your wonderful presentations. Um, in the words of uh, Lady Galaga, talented, brilliant, amazing, show-stopping, never been done before. Um, also, special shout out to my attention starved children peeps. You know who you are, Illy. Um, and my question is, as Bennies and Johnnies, how can we help support this cause and encourage uh, the administration of our schools to do what's right and encourage our peers and families outside of the school to help repair relations with Native communities? Um, I think to start, um, 
as you can see from all of the work here we have from archival research to actively working with Native communities, I don't think it's one strong answer and it really depends on what you're going for. Um, for example, my work is very useful in, um, I, I can easily partner with Dan and work on compiling research and reaching out to um, communities and other academics to help create a stronger research field to support work. Um, but my work itself would not be relevant often with administrative work, because again, this is historical work. Um, most of the people we work with were born in the 1870s. They're dead. Um, so it really does depend on what you're going for. I would say with supporting the administration, my work would be very useful for proving the point that we do still have a lot of work to do and there is strong reason for it. Um, but I think if you're talking about building communities, um, Faith and Balin and um, Ted and Dan and stuff would have much more to say on that. Um, yeah, I think if you really want to help and support these Native um, communities, one pretty simple thing is to attend events like this. Like when we have a bigger group of people listening to these stories and understanding and learning, that gets our message out there and that's a great first step. Um, we are also going to be starting a Indigenous Peoples Club. And so we're gonna be have a look out for that soon because we're gonna be hosting some events, hopefully once COVID kind of clears up too, but soon. So that's one thing to keep a lookout for. Also, I would just like to point out, because it just popped in my head, it's very common in college campuses as people graduate for causes to sort of die off because the people who are prominent in these are very often upperclassmen because as they've gone through school, they've gained experience. So I would say another thing is important to do is just try not to let things die out as people graduate. It can be very easy to forget to do that. Um, and we see this happening a lot. And so just remembering to stay aware of things that are happening around you and to continually support them and introduce other people that are underclassmen to you to them. And to kind of add to that, it never hurts to talk about these things. Like it, just raising general awareness on campus of like, this is what our history is. Let's make it a normalized thing to have discussions about it. Um, that is a very powerful thing as well. And if you are looking for ways to get involved, click on the link that I sent to the chat. And I, and I want to also echo that it, these are very um, difficult conversations, um, but in the work that you all have been doing, um, you know, I mean, you think about it, we've been doing this, you know, when we have time, right? And, and it's only been a, a very short amount of time. Um, but the work that we've been doing, this will be one of the first, if not the first um, school that was a, a religious run boarding school that helps to make these, these documents and these stories and these items available to the community and the country. So, you know, it, what you're doing hasn't really been done before. Um, and so I, I'm very thankful for you, for all of you and I, I am so much looking forward to continuing this work. Um, and yeah, so I, I think you've all been brave. <laughs> you've all taken on these conversations that are uncomfortable at times and difficult, but um, you know, I hope that you feel you've been treated with respect um, and with care. You know, I, I care very much about everybody that I've been working with. Um, everyone has been very kind back to me and, and to the community. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy with where things are going and I see so much potential for everybody um, that is involved with this work. Thank you. Yeah, I, I am, uh, I, I'm so proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish so far and uh, Sean and Charlie, it's a, it's a really great question that you asked. Everybody has different skills and ways in which they can contribute. And no matter what your, your, your major is, your area, your area of expertise, um, if you want to get involved, first off, you can get in touch with me and I will find a way in which I can match your skills with, 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 some, with some kind of need. Uh, you know, uh, Jamie and I, you know, uh, you know we, 
we, we've been able to, to, to find a whole number of ways in which students can, can put their skills to good use. Um, I also, of course, I want to plug in, you know, look at the chat we have here. Um, uh, you know, Maya uh, sent out uh, a, a GoFundMe raising, uh, raising funds. And you know, it's five bucks or, or, or whatever it is, anything uh, uh, you can contribute right there is an immediate step you can take. Uh, there's a forms manager as well, looking for people to sign up. And, um, and, and there's this, this opportunity tomorrow as well. In terms of the administration and getting larger changes here, I think part of it is just recognizing that we don't know about this history. We don't talk about the history of these campuses. The more people know, the harder it, be it becomes to, uh, to, to act like this didn't happen. And while people, I can understand people in a leadership position being afraid to confront this, this history, the good news is, is look at all the great things that come out of doing it. And there's so much more to gain in confronting this than there is from hiding from it. Uh, so so that, that's, that's kind of what I have to say. Thank you for, for your question, Sean and Charlie. And relating to that, we just have one more final question. Um, we have an attendee who's from outside of the state of Minnesota and they're wondering if there's any ways that you can get involved um, in communities outside of Minnesota or ways to educate people from communities outside of Minnesota? I, I, I wanna say absolutely. It's, I, um, I'd have to know a little bit more about what the community, what, what particular community it is, um, but, but absolutely. And, um, and if somebody knows of a particular community outside of, uh, outside of Minnesota that, that they want to help or serve in some way, um, that, you know, one, uh, one possibility is, um, I'd say, well, first re reach out to me and, uh, and, and we could talk about kind of what you have in mind. And then also then look at what that community that, that you're interested in serving, um, what what some of the uh, what, what some of their some of the needs they've identified are, and see what kind of opportunities to uh, uh, to support them are out there. Awesome. Well, thank you all for all that you're doing. And before we end, I would just like to echo all that Dr. Gordon said earlier. Um, and on behalf of the McCarthy Center and everyone here, I would just like to thank all of the presenters. You're all clearly doing very incredible research and work for our community and the greater community. So thank you all. And then I would also like to thank, extend a, a, extend a special thank you to Jamie Arsenal for taking time to be here with us tonight. Um, we're very appreciative to have you. And then also to Dr. Gordon for bringing this night together and for all the work that you're doing. And I would also like to thank all the attendees. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you at the event tomorrow and continued engagement. Thank you all. All of you, thank you so very much for everything. And, and, and thank you, Sydney, uh, for, uh, for, 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 for hosting this and the McCarthy Center. Uh, we really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share what we're doing. So, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.